Matthew, we finished chapter 8 last week. We finished chapter 8 with um, sort of a teaching on, and it's sort of off the beaten path teaching. We don't really like to focus a lot on demonology or, or the, the nature of uh, unclean spirits and that sort of thing, but they are real and possessions are real and that sort of thing can happen. And we had an example of that in the closing of chapter 8 last week we, where Jesus and his disciples were traveling. They encountered a man or a couple of men that were possessed by unclean spirits. And so they besought him to rather than cast them out altogether, but allow them, if he cast them out, to allow them to go and inhabit a herd of swine. And we talked about this some. Well, where else would they go? That might be a question that, uh, that you could ask. Well, the Bible says concerning such spirits as that, that, uh, how, do I, how do I phrase this? I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit from Scripture, okay? When the unclean spirit is cast out of a man, it wanders, the Bible says, it wanders in dry places seeking rest. Now, it doesn't give us much detail as to what exactly it means by dry places, but it sounds like a spirit that has been disembodied, a devil or an, an, an unclean spirit, whatever the case may be, that is disembodied is not in a state of rest. It's not in a state of peace. And so it's looking for a body to inhabit. Well, so where did these unclean spirits come from? Well, we don't really know. There, there's the honest answer. We don't really know a lot about it. We don't know if they, uh, and there's theories that abound. Uh, are they fallen angels? I think it's very likely. Uh, are they demons? I think that's also very likely. Are fallen angels and demons the same things? Not necessarily. And so it really kind of opens up a can uh, into a subject that the Bible doesn't speak much about. And there's reasons for that. And in fact, I think I'm going to take a moment on this to curb any kind of unhealthy interest in the subject. The key word there being unhealthy. C.S. Lewis has talked about it. Reverend, and I, Reverend uh, DeRyder and I have discussed it also. C.S. Lewis wrote concerning uh, an interest in such things as devils and demons and unclean spirits and fallen angels and what they are and, and where they come from and all of that. Uh, C.S. Lewis made a statement that there are two uh, equal or opposite errors that people can fall into concerning the devils. He said the first one is to disbelieve in them completely. That really is an error. You can't write them off. You can't say that they're not real. The Bible talks about them. They are very real. Okay. But he also said that the other error is to experience an unhealthy, excessive interest in them. And the devil is equally pre pleased with either error. We don't really need to know much about them. Would it be wrong to, to study about them? No, it wouldn't be wrong. But it's just creepy. Doesn't really do you any good. And if you let it lead you down the wrong paths, okay, then we're going to go back to our Star Wars metaphor, all right? And I think it's a very good metaphor, you know. Any of this dark side stuff, you start getting too curious about it and peeping too deeply into it, you can really open some doors. You can really find yourself opening some doors in your mind that you have a hard time closing. And so it's good to just take the apostles' advice and stay simple concerning such things. It doesn't edify. Does it really help us to live a more godly life if we have a perfect understanding of the origin of demons? It, it sure doesn't help me. It doesn't help me glorify God or bring glory to the kingdom of God. Now, and I, I don't do any real promoting of, of ignorance, okay? Because knowledge is power and it's knowledge rightly used. Well, that could be called wisdom, all right? But some things you just don't really need to know. And there's a reason why the Bible is silent on a lot of it. And I believe, I really believe that that silence is for our own protection. Uh, well, but we're spiritual creatures, aren't we? So we should be able to handle that sort of thing. Well, yes, sure, we should be able to. And yes, we are spiritual creatures, but we also live in a natural body. And the workings of how those two things interface 
we don't really know a whole lot about. We don't really know a whole lot about. And you're never going to learn that from the scientific community because they spend too much of their time denying the existence of the spiritual because they worship the God of the empirical. They can't see beyond the evidence of their own five senses. Now that evidence is good and it's taken us very far and it's brought us a lot of benefits in this life. So we're not anti-science, okay? But when they deny the existence of the spiritual because it's not something that they can either quantify or measure or understand or anything like that, well, then they've kind of, they've, they come up short. They come up short. So we are spiritual creatures, but we inhabit physical bodies. And we will inhabit these bodies until these bodies wear out and break down and finally give out completely. And then we will not be in them anymore. But then, all right, at the end of this thing, at the very, very end of this thing we read about in Scripture, we will be raised up again from the dead just like Jesus was. That was not just a metaphor for us to experience newness of life in the spiritual sense, but that was also the paving of the way for us to be raised up again from the dead. What happens if my body is destroyed in a fire or I drown at, at sea and my body is lost? And it None of that matters. God made us to begin with. He can certainly remake us again just like that with the same DNA, only glorified, invincible, ageless, and all of the other things that we will experience in the eternal perfect state once sin is gone and the devil is gone and everything is remade, the new heaven and the new earth and all of that. This is a rabbit trail, I understand, but it kind of branches out from our concluding teaching from last week. Devils, demons, unclean spirits, fallen angels. There's some things that are good to know about them, but we won't really have to become experts. And we certainly should not obsess. So what's the difference between a devil and a demon? Well, the word devil, okay, is more of a character description than I think a spiritual one. The word itself, I believe, means slanderer. So when you hear somebody else calling someone else a devil, all right, they're not saying that they're some demon out of the pits of hell. That might be what they're trying to say. But it's, it just means slanderer. And that's what the devil is. The devil is a slanderer. He's always been an accuser of the brethren. He, that's, that's just, it speaks of his character and so on. Demons are a little bit different. Fallen angels, those are a little bit different. And so on. Maybe we'll cover that in a topical Bible study another time. But in our, in, in our concluding teaching last week, we saw that they inherited or they inhabited these swine and the swine were smarter <laughs> we were smart enough to know that it was better to be dead than to let one of those things live in them. And, well, isn't that a sin? Well, no, they're animals. Animals have no law and therefore no sin. They're animals. They can do whatever they want to do. They live and they die and they're done. And that's the end of the story. So there's nothing really to be extrapolated from that. But moving on from this incident, the people came out from town hearing what had been done and rather than glorifying God and rejoicing that these two formerly demon-possessed men had been delivered, they were upset that they'd lost their herd of swine. Maybe understandably, it's a lot of money. It's a good piece of money there. But that's where their priorities were. Moving on, chapter 9, verse 1 says, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came in, into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying in a bed, or lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Why did he call him son? Why did he call him son? Well, this was Jesus, who is God, who is the Son of God. And again, you can get into trying to parse out the Trinity and all of that. But Jesus, the Son of God, is still God. And Jesus is the creator of the three. He is the one who made everything that was made. That's covered in another portion of Scripture. So he says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said, said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? 
For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house, and when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. All right, so let's take this paragraph right here, verses 1 through 7, this episode. What happened? Jesus came unto his own city. They brought to him a man who was sick of the palsy. Now, whether this palsy was the same kind of palsy we understand that word to mean today, either way, he was debilitated. He was crippled. He could not leave his bed. He was probably all cramped up and couldn't even move his limbs hardly at all. And so that's no way to live. That really is no way to live. That's, that's, that's a profound statement, I know. But they brought them to Jesus. That's a demonstration of faith. They'd heard that Jesus could save or they'd heard that Jesus could heal, could restore. They'd heard tales about people or perhaps they'd heard reports by now already of uh, people being lepers being cleansed and the blind receiving sight and so on. So they brought this man to Jesus and Jesus then seeing their faith, he says here in verse two, said unto the sick of the palsy, son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, wait a second. Wait a second. They didn't bring him to Jesus to get sins forgiven. They brought him to Jesus to be healed of his physical affliction. So why is Jesus, why is Jesus addressing his sins? That might be a question that comes to mind. I think a legitimate question. There's nothing wrong with questioning scripture. There is something wrong with arguing with it. You know what I'm saying? Because that's just not a lose. That, that's just not a winning fight. That's a losing proposition. Whenever you try to contend with the word of God because there's something in it that you don't like. But there's nothing wrong with questioning it. Questioning it means you want to understand it better. Amen? So, they bring him to Jesus. Jesus says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Could it be that Jesus was addressing the more important problem first? And could it be that Jesus, already detecting what was going on in the hearts of these that were round about them, namely the scribes, and we know about the scribes, the scribes were uh, among the religious sects that acted in a certain capacity, they recorded things, they wrote things down, I think, were they copyists of the law, perhaps? I don't know if that fell under their umbrella of responsibility. Not much said about the scribes. There's much more said about the Pharisees, but what's said about both groups is not kind. It's not complimentary. But it could be that Jesus already detecting the vibe that was in their heart. Maybe he was even setting it up to elicit some kind of a response from them so that he could then springboard off of that and teach them. We could speculate all day long, but he addresses the more important issue first. That's not to say that he didn't care about the man's uh, his crippling condition. He did care. And that's proven in the, in the verses that follow. But what's more important than that? Sin. Sin is by far the most important because you can be a quadriplegic. You can be a paraplegic. You can be suffering from a terminal illness that's going to eventually end your life. And then get healed of that or get cured of that, or something along those lines, but still die and go to hell, ultimately. Healing's important, but what good in the long run is healing if we still die lost? It's kind of like, okay, well, thanks for the reprieve from this suffering, but now I'm going to go enter into eternal suffering because I don't have Christ in my life. The most important thing, and this is a very important, this is a very important message for the church, the modern church, any kind of church at all, okay? Missions of mercy, medical missions, homeless missions, soup kitchens, shelters, things like that, these are all good things. They're all good things. They're all noble things. And they speak of having a compassionate and an empathetic heart towards people that are suffering in this life. But they must always remain secondary, if not even tertiary or further down the chain. They must always remain at least secondary to the gospel message itself. Because that 
is the primary, you could even call it the sole function of the church, is the gospel, the word of God. The gospel message is a specific message within the word of God, but you can expand that in a broader context to, to include the entire word of God and all that it teaches us. That is the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to reach the lost and to edify and, to edify and perfect the saved. It, it, when you remember that, it keeps things from getting cloudy. It keeps things from getting blurry in your own understanding. Well, why don't we run soup kitchens, Pastor Snyder? Why don't we reach out to the homeless and have a shelter and all of that? Well, there's lots of reasons. And again, I'm not finding fault with those kinds of missions. I'm not finding fault with them at all. And in ages past, there have been tremendous, tremendous uh, good works accomplished for the kingdom of God in reaching out to the poor and the disfranchised and, 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 the, and orphans and people that had been neglected by society. So I'm not saying that any of that is bad and it's all very, very good. But the most important thing remains the gospel because it is the gospel alone. It's not food. It's not shelters. It's not programs. It's none of these things. The only thing that changes the human heart is the gospel. It's the only thing that brings a person from a state of darkness and sin and corruption and a life that is on its way to judgment. It's the only thing that changes the direction of that life. So other reasons why we don't have those these other types of outreach efforts going on is because one, we don't have the facilities. Two, you have any idea the logistics involved in those things. You got to have a major major, major operation going on to even begin in, to even begin reaching out into those things. And local laws make it very difficult to get involved in anything that involves sheltering the homeless, feeding the hungry, anything. You, you see what I'm saying? And it's getting harder. It used to be 30, 40 years ago, you just, you just prop a tent up out there in the parking lot and reach out to all the homeless folks and say, come on over. You know, and then preach the gospel to them and use the one as a vehicle for the other. And again, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But the gospel is the most important thing. There are other institutions that exist to meet some of these other needs. I don't think they're sufficient. I don't, well, not because they're not good enough. I just don't think there's enough of them. Okay? But what's the mission of the church? Is it to help people pay their electric bills? No. Sometimes that can be done. But that's not the main mission of the church. Is it to help people who need gas money? No. It's that sort of thing can be done. And we've done that. But it's not the main mission of the church. Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, they didn't even vocalize this. They were just thinking it in their minds, you know, as opposed to some other part of their body. They were thinking it in their minds. Son, or they said, this man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, well, what's up with that? Well, Jesus is omniscience. That's what's up with that. Jesus is God, the Son of God. And so he knew the thoughts. He knew the hearts of these men. Whether it was because he could read their minds or not, I don't know. Or maybe he could simply read all of the body language that they were portraying. Because people have very readable body language. Many of them do. Most people have terrible poker faces. Most people wear everything that's going on in their life. Or many people wear everything that's going on in their life. They wear it on their face. They wear it in their posture. They wear it in, in the tone of voice when they do communicate. And you can read them and you're like, something's going on there. It's a fact. It's a fact. So, but I don't know. I don't know if that was the case here. If Jesus was just reading their body language or if he actually knew their thoughts. But he says, knowing, knowing their thoughts said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man, which is just another name or title for the Son of God because He's both. He's the Son of Man, particularly through the lineage of David. He's also the Son of God through the miraculous conception of the Holy Ghost or the immaculate conception of the Holy Ghost. And that's a true doctrine. That's 100% Bible. Jesus was conceived by a virgin and was born by a virgin. Just thought I'd slip that in there to cover that base. 
but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And then he turned to the man who was sick of the palsy. Arise, take up thy bed and go into thine house. What was he accomplishing here? What was he accomplishing here? He was accomplishing a lot of things. He was showing mercy on a man who was afflicted so badly he couldn't even get out of his own bed and live his life. So there's mercy and compassion there. And he was educating a pack of fault finders, the scribes, who were finding fault with Jesus in their heart, judging him in their heart and judging him wrongly in their heart. He was accomplishing, he's killing two birds with one stone. So he heals a man to prove the point that he has both the authority to forgive people of sins because God can do that and to show that he has power over the flesh to heal of afflictions. The greater lesson here is that Jesus had all authority both to forgive sins, to heal afflicted bodies, and his language here almost seems to connect the two. And not just here, but it's elsewhere. It's connected elsewhere in Scripture. That if a person experiences healing, a miraculous healing of their illness or of their disease or of their affliction, it is an evidence that they have been forgiven of their sins. Are we making that click? Okay, well then what if I'm afflicted and I'm not healed of my sins? Does it, or I'm not healed of my affliction. Does that mean that I'm not forgiven of my sins? No, the connection doesn't work both ways. Because there have been lots of people that have been, Jesus, had, Jesus forgave this man of his sins before he healed him of his palsy. The one is evidence of the other, but not the other way around. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So a person can be, forgiven of their sins, but still have to deal with a certain challenge in their life, whatever that might be. And sometimes it's a very grievous challenge. We have a friend back east for years. Was it, is it multiple sclerosis? This uh, one, a pastor for many years in our organization had been suffering from multiple sclerosis, walking with crutches, uh, walking with the aid of his wife, just trying to function, dealing with pain, the likes of which most of us have probably never had, physical pain. And yet, absolutely dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I remember once, uh, many years ago, Pastor Davis sharing a letter from him in a class that he was teaching. Um, and it kind of dealt with some of the challenges that he was dealing with. And describing, describing how he was reacting to the pain. James chapter 5, that's where that other verse is. You know what, let's, let's turn to that really quick. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That's the key to those two verses right there. So if a person is sick and they've prayed for healing and others have prayed for healing or however, it doesn't matter if others have prayed for healing. If that person experiences healing according to their prayer, then it's an evidence that if they'd had an, that if they had sins at that point, that those sins have been forgiven. It's an act of mercy. It's an act of mercy. And that's what a loving God does. But anyway. We rabbit trailed on that story about the pastor, but the pain that he experienced as a result of his disease, the way that he reacted to it was he allowed it to draw him closer to God. And he was very plain about that in his language also, because with that kind of pain, the flesh really is kind of crucified and uh, isn't really thinking about carnal and fleshly appetites. It just doesn't want to hurt anymore. Now, does that mean that pain makes a person holy? No. Okay. And uh, we, we are not of those. Uh, we are not of those people that deliberately afflict ourselves physically because we think it brings us closer to God. That really doesn't glorify God. But if things happen to come our way, then why not let it draw us closer to God? I mean, it's a whole lot better than the alternative, letting it letting it get us angry at God or letting it get us angry at God and and shake our fists at him. It's just that's just not a good way to go. So Jesus's omniscience and Jesus's omnipotence 
or what are demonstrated in this episode of Scripture here. He had the authority to heal sickness. He had the authority to forgive sins. And so he did both. And he did it in the sight of the fault finders so that they would see and that they would know something's going on here that is above what they were thinking. So he says to him, Arise, take up thy bed and go into, go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God. All right, well, this is a whole different attitude than the people that own the swine. This is how the people that own the pigs should have. This is how they should have responded. They glorified God. They marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Verse nine, next paragraph. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. There's a lesson in that. Jesus is influential. If we let him be influential. I always, I've always marveled at that and, and in other parts of the scripture when Jesus picked out his, uh, his core disciples, the ones who would be the apostles. And he just walked past and you saw the fishermen on the shore, John and James, Simon and Andrew, and they're m mending their nets. And he just walked by and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they just like dropped their nets that instant and got up and followed Jesus. You want to talk about a Jedi mind trick? Well, it was a lot better than that because that's messing with someone's head and Jesus wasn't doing that. Jesus was just saying, follow me. And we do well to respond the same way. We really do. Verse 10, next paragraph. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came to sat down to, and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? More fault finders. You know, why couldn't these guys back Jesus up? Have you ever asked yourself that? Why couldn't they just get in the boat, get on board, learn something, and be disciples of someone who clearly knew more, understood better, and had more power than they had? Because they were filled with knowledge, but they didn't really have any wisdom. And they had absolutely no power at all. But that's what happens when we, when we become puffed up with overmuch knowledge. And the Bible even tells us that knowledge puffeth up. Well, these Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, and these other um, highly educated, uh, highly trained people of these religious sects were puffed up in their knowledge. They were so puffed up in their knowledge that they thought that their knowledge was salvation. They thought that their knowledge was the key to everything, and it wasn't. And when, we begin, when people become puffed up in their knowledge, they become puffed up is just another way of saying proud. When they become proud of their knowledge, then they become unteachable. And the moment we become unteachable, we've lost the fight. Because there's always something that we can learn. I'm no exception. The people that taught me are no exception. We can never be unteachable. We can't. We can't afford to ever have that kind of an attitude. Unteachable. And when you're unteachable, you're not willing to follow anybody. Or if you are, it's not for the right reasons. It's not for the right reasons. So here they are, fault finding, which is what proud people do, thinking that they know everything. And there are people that come to church like that, usually from other churches, usually from other churches. And they come into they come into the church house and, and they want to. Oh, I understand if they're a brother or sister in Christ, they want to be known that they're a brother and sister in Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. I would want to be uh, I would want it known if I was visiting a church or going to a church for the first time. And I have already received Christ as my savior. I would want them to understand, hey, I'm one of you. I'm of the same spirit. Let me worship with you guys. Right. But then what happens when the preacher gets up and teaches something that's new? Well, no, new to the person, okay? From the Word of God, new to that person. Well, that's the test of discipleship there, isn't it? That's the real test of discipleship. Are they then humble enough as genuine disciples of our Lord to receive it? Or do they get torqued and bent out of shape? How dare he say something about my life? And I thought that half the mission of the church was the edification and, and the perfection of the saints. 
We can't be like that. We can't be like these Pharisees, proud, unteachable, and thinking that we know it all, preferring the role of a teacher when God would have us, would prefer us to be in the role of a student. We can't. And I'm not insinuating that anybody here is, okay? That's simply one of the lessons that we can, one of the very plain, glaring lessons that we can pull right out of this paragraph of Scripture. So what did, what did these Pharisees do? These Pharisees that fancied themselves masters and, 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 and subject matter experts and you can't tell them anything new, don't you know, because we already know it all, don't you know? And so they reacted, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Well, what were publicans? Publicans were tax collectors. They were native Jewish tax collectors working for the Roman government. These were hated people. The Jews despised them. They were like quislings of the Nazis. Not as bad, but they were hated just about as much. They really were. If you know anything about uh, the, the quis well, what were quislings? Okay, well, now I've opened that up. But the quislings were Jews in Nazi Germany that worked for the Nazis to entrap and catch Jews. They were turncoats and traitors of the worst sort. Well, these guys were kind of in the same neighborhood, publicans. They were hated men because they were working for the oppressor, the Roman government. And then sinners, that's self-explanatory. Uh, self they were eating with sinners and, and publicans. And so the Pharisees found fault. But Jesus, verse 12, but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, so he called them out. They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye, and I imagine he kind of did a kind of a hand wave. I don't think he did, but I imagine that he did, okay? He kind of did a hand wave when he said it. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not called, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, this is a big deal right here. This is a big deal. It's been misapplied a lot of times, but the, there's, there's, a, there's a very good message in this and a lesson for us. The clear teaching is that Jesus identifies the human race as sick with sin and therefore in need of a spiritual physician. This wasn't, weren't they just finding fault with him for keeping company with? Now, he wasn't acting like and he wasn't letting them influence him. He wasn't acting like a sinner. He wasn't living the life of a sinner. He wasn't bellying up to the bar with them and knocking back a couple of cold ones. It's not what he was doing. But he was sitting down and eating with these people. And when, they, when the Pharisees found fault with them, that's when he turned and he spoke to them in a metaphor. He said, they that behold don't need a physician. What was he saying? These people are sick. I'm attending to the sick. They're spiritually sick. I'm attending to the spiritually sick. He said, I was, I, I've come to call not the righteous, not, the, the, not those that don't need the gospel, but sinners, sinners to repentance. What, ne what need does a healthy person have of a doctor? I, I know preventative medicine and all that, but generally people go to a physician once they've come down with something and it's gotten bad enough that it's interrupted their life and they can't continue on or they need some help. It's the same way with Jesus. And it was the same way with every single one of us when we lived in sin. All right, what can we take away from tonight's teachings? What can we take away from it? Sin is always a much more serious problem than health problems. Make sure that whatever you're going through in life, that your heart is right with God. Make sure that that is always right with God because that can be taken care of in a moment. That can be taken care of with one single, genuine, contrite prayer of faith. God, forgive me. Always make sure that the air is clear between you and God. That there's nothing standing between you and God. Physical problems, we pray for healing. We do that a lot. Because people get sick a lot. It happens. It's part of living on the earth. It comes with living in a fallen world. But more important, most important is always... Always a relationship with God. Sin wrecks it. But the blood of Jesus cleanses of all sin, doesn't it? So we take that from... And to remember also why Jesus came. 
And we talk about that a lot too. So I don't think we're in any danger of forgetting it. But in the busyness of our lives, don't forget, Jesus came to solve the sin problem. Physicians can do a lot. Doctors can do a lot. Acupuncture can do a lot if it's the right people and they're not quacks. You know, chiropractors can do a lot. But the only one that can take care of the sin problem is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.